So uh, I'd now like to introduce this month's uh, presenter, Clinton Nicholson. Uh, prior to entering the healthcare industry, Clinton spent over 15 years working for a growing, working for and growing a dynamic Fortune 100 company where culture informed the operations and operations championed the culture. Since becoming a licensed counselor, Clinton has spent nearly a decade integrating his operational background with clinical acumen to design behavioral health programs that implement the highest levels of client care while fostering employee and company wellness. Over the last two and a half years as Chief Operating Officer for Peaks Recovery Centers, Clinton's energy has been devoted to creating systems that support true integrated models of healthcare leaders who are amongst the best in their fields and operations which guide the ongoing success and expansion of an organization that envisions disrupting the treatment industry through quality, innovative care. Today's topic title is The Highest Power, a new book for the Old Testament of Treatment, and I will let Clinton explain what that means to you guys. Yeah. That is remarkably uncomfortable listening to, I'm not going to lie. So, uh, that, well, thank you guys for having me. My name is Clinton Nicholson, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Peaks Recovery Centers. We are a mental health and substance use treatment center in Colorado, obviously. Colorado Springs and Denver, primarily. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I'm a Chief Operating Officer, so I really have no business standing here right now. I'm not a presenter, <laughs> typically, so please bear with me. Um, I got talked into this by Jess. <laughs> and Nicole and TJ, so yeah. Uh, Cool. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, I will do my best to also not stand behind here, but some of my notes are here, the slideshow is here, and that is the best title I could come up with. I, I really, <laughs> I wrestled with it, I trust me. Um, so, all right, a uh, couple of caveats before we start. Might be some triggering content, uh, mostly psychologically. I don't think it's gonna be uh, maybe some spiritually triggering stuff. So just heads up, it's there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just ask to that we engage this topic with an open mind. I'm going to take it a couple different directions. And Colorado, oh, I might not speak. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> See, <laughs> I'm a mess. So uh, it's uh, the treatment world in Colorado is uh, actually quite different than it is in California. So I've been learning a lot about that since I got here literally yesterday. So. Wish me luck, and please don't throw anything at me if you get if you don't like the topic here. All right, cool. All right, so we'll um, really I think you know trying to come up with something to talk about. Again, being an operations guy, I guess I could come up and talk about like the nuances of operating a behavioral health company. That just sounded miserable, um, even to me, and uh, so I really had to kind of dive for sort of what. Uh, really my, my own processes right now, both as like as a leader, as a developer of programming, as a sort of um, attempted innovator of treatment within the field. And I kind of landed very organically in this, uh, in this realm of spirituality. And trust me, I'm as surprised as you guys are. It is not my thing. Uh, I am pretty uh, closed off in general. And we're going to learn why right now. Um, but I'm going to take you guys on a journey. And mostly it's a thought process. Uh, and it is not complete. So I'm just going to you know, bury the lead right now. I don't necessarily have answers to what we're about to talk about. So I'm actually curious about insight, about how this lands with you guys, and really kind of just creating a dialogue. So, so the journey begins in Anchorage, Alaska. So this is where I was born, where I'm from. But yeah, there you go, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you guys who don't know what a military brat is, just the child of somebody in the military. Typically, brats don't go into the military. They just remain brats for their lives. And uh, <laughs> it, oh, there you go, yeah, exactly. So um, with that said, obviously, a relatively conservative environment growing up, and uh, actually that continued when I moved to Colorado Springs. This is pretty much where I grew up. And Colorado Springs is an interesting place. Um, are any of you guys familiar with Colorado Springs at all? Well, you're about to, <laughs> here we go. As you can see, it's beautiful. It's at the base of the Rocky Mountains. It is actually higher than Denver, so we're above a mile, way cooler. 
Uh, but it's also known for Pike's Peak and the Garden of the Gods. Uh, absolutely beautiful aesthetically. Uh, culturally, not so much. Um, it just gets, I guess, complicated. So there are seven military bases in the state of Colorado. Five of them are in Colorado Springs. So as you can imagine, it is heavily influenced by the military and it is notoriously the most conservative city in Colorado. Uh, it is also the second largest city in Colorado just after Denver. So interesting cultural dynamic there. It is known for many things. One being the evangelical church. Uh, so the f Colorado Springs is often referred to as the far west buckle of the Bible Belt. Uh, that's great, yeah. It's a great <laughs> reputation. Also, the Evangelical Vatican is another one. And uh, the reason is there are four, over 400 churches in this area. The largest church is New Life Church, which is an evangelical, evangelical church with over 10,000 members. So it's huge. It's, uh, and it has a lot of, the reason why I bring this up is because of the cultural impact that it has on the city. It's uh, very prevalent and very pervasive. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the evangelical church, it's typically a more political wing of the Christian faith and um, is extra, uh, even more so in Colorado Springs. So. All right, focus on the family. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah. Another lovely organization that <laughs> who is uh, not what I would consider inclusive. Uh, they are pretty much at the forefront of a lot of legislation that particularly attacks the LGBTQ plus community, um, all in the name of preservation of the whole family, correct? Uh, yes, of course, their definition of family is quite limited, it's pretty narrow, you know, mom, dad, dog, kids, that kind of stuff. So, uh, and of course, we also have the most recently the Club Q shooting. So this is another um, thing that we have been on the map for most recently. And as you can see, uh, while the city itself is very conservative and there are culturally limited avenues as far as expression goes, particularly for the LGBTQ plus community, there are obvious allies out there. And there are, again, very few places for these for our community to meet. Um, however, this was one of them, and it was uh, taken away. So it is, there are talks of trying to open it back up, but it's pretty limited, again, when the community itself is relatively small and now more disjointed than ever. So cool. So that's where I live. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. <laughs> It's pretty cool, yeah, I know. Jealous, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So imagine LA, but the opposite. Yeah. Like, yeah, weather, traffic, culture included. Yeah, we're pretty much the opposite of that. But there is a reason why I stay there. There is a reason why I've actually moved and lived all over the United States uh, and um, somehow always tend to go back. And I think it's because there is a strong cultural connection that I do have. Um, so a little bit more about me. I graduated from high school in the Air Force Academy. So this was my reality for a very long time. Uh, I actually ended up getting a bachelor's degree in literature. Books, that's the best I could do. And <laughs> yeah, I went literal, I know. Uh, and then I have a master's degree in uh, clinical mental health counseling. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but I mean, that's pretty much my graduate degree right there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, which of course that obviously makes me a, an expert in nothing. So, <laughs> absolutely nothing. Um, so the rest of this presentation, just to be quite clear, these are opinions. So this is, I'm not trying to speak from a place of authority. I'm not trying to speak from a place of being an expert. I'm just kind of really talking about my own process and sort of what that exploration has looked like over the last really just three months, three or four months. So um, let's, I want to start with 
kind of where my general belief system about treatment in general is and kind of where Peaks Recovery Centers has really sort of been heading and kind of where I've been guiding it. Um, so over the last several decades, such treatment has undergone a fraught but necessary evolution beyond the abstinence-based models, modalities, and beliefs of the past. Additionally, as integrated models of care have rightfully lessened the clinical distance between sudden mental health treatment, the therapeutic and ideological limitations of traditional sud methods have been exposed. Uh, long story short, we're not really good at our job all the time. Like we really, if we're gonna be honest, like we have a lot of work to do. And uh, particularly substance use treatment is one of the most um, resistant to transformation and change. And uh, I think it has actually, thank goodness, interdisciplinary care has started to kind of bridge the gap between mental health primary and substance use primary, and essentially, in my mind, eliminated it. Um, so at Peaks, we run off a couple of tenets here. So addiction isn't real. Like addiction is a concept. It is not a medical term. It is not a diagnosis. It is a social construct. It is a way, a, a colloquialism that we use to talk about people who are different, people who are, uh, lack willpower, people who are out of control, right? So at Peaks in particular, we got rid of the word addiction. Again, I want to be really clear as we move through this presentation that a lot of people have actually found solace, being able to identify as an addict and being able to recognize that this is a part of who they are and this is something that they are dealing with. And that's great. Also, it's relatively limited, and it does have a tremendous amount of shame and trauma attached to it. And with that being said, the, if we're really trauma-informed, uh, anything that reinforces a shame state would obviously be counter to that, right? So if we get rid of the word, because words have power, we actually open ourselves up a little bit more give ourselves a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more wiggle room, a little bit more space to sort of maneuver, which brings us to the next tenet here, which is substance use disorders are mental health disorders, period, right? It's, it's a diagnosis. It's not a state of mind. It's, not, uh, it's, it's a behavior. It's a coping strategy. Um, and oftentimes, they're underlying mental health concerns that have to be addressed in order for the substance use disorder itself to be addressed. So. Let's just call it what it is. Substance use disorders are mental health disorders, which means we can actually eliminate this idea of a substance use track and a mental health track and just have treatment. People just need treatment, right? And with that said, at Peaks, we took it a step further and said we don't actually treat diagnoses, we treat suffering. If there's a common thread throughout everybody that comes through our program, they're suffering, right? And they're looking for release. They're looking for some sort of closure, some sort of, I don't know, reprieve. And if we acknowledge that we're treating suffering, then we can actually look and see, all right, so what is the opposite not of addiction, right? Because that's Johan, that's his thing, the opposite of addiction is connection. What if the opposite of suffering is connection? That changes the way we engage, right? It makes community milieu a huge part of the treatment process. It's less about what we say as clinicians and more about the environment that we foster as facilities. So, so that's great, awesome. Obviously, it's genius, and we're just gonna like, yeah. Presentation's over, you're welcome, yeah. I will share the slides with you, don't even worry. Yeah, stop taking pictures. Um, no, so with that said, you know, I love what we do and what we believe. And even with all the successes, we're always looking for opportunities, right? Like, because again, we have low AMA rates, we have great outcomes, well above industry standard, but the industry standard 
the bar is so low. Like, it's just so low. It's not good enough. Like, we have to keep doing better. So there's always this idea that there's a missing piece somewhere. Again, Getty image. I didn't do that. Uh, yeah, so, um, and we're always looking again, like one of our goals through Peaks is to disrupt the industry. But we want to do it through quality care. It's not about going on the outside and tearing things down. It's about going on the inside and building things up. Excuse me, building things up. So this brings me to January 2020 where I attended the Winter Symposium, which is just another symposium, you know, lots of tote bags, lots of hand sanitizer, lots of, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh, God, I have so much hand sanitizer. Um, but here I was introduced to a couple of really important concepts that have started to, that really challenged me, um, not only as a clinician, but uh, as a leader and as, I don't know, just a human being, which I'm not a huge fan of that, but who is, right? <laughs> um, so one of the concepts actually came about when uh, Peaks facilitated a panel discussion. Okay, that is not the panel, just so you know. Like, that's, <laughs> yeah, literally. I like, you can tell on yourself. Yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> Our panel was way cooler than that. Like, the people looked super stellar. So, uh, but it was actually a panel on psychedelic medications. Um, and this was in response to Proposition 122, which was just passed in Colorado, which legalized five types of psychedelic medications. Not only did it decriminalize them, but it opened the doors for them to be used in actual clinical treatment. So this is, most of the studies right now have really focused on PTSD, uh, particularly in Colorado, because we do have such a high vet population. So, um, and the early numbers are staggeringly uh, positive. The outcomes are almost unbelievable. And the energy around it is um, potent to a point where it's actually a little concerning because people start to look at these treatments as like a panacea. It's like, oh, I just need to like trip balls and I'm good, right? That's not it. Um, but during this actual uh, panel discussion, uh, a doctor, her name is um, Dr. Uh, Dana Lerman, she brought up this idea of internal healing IQ. This, if this is triggering, this is one of the, this is about as bad as it gets. So those are mushrooms, so yeah. Psilocybin, if you wanna be really high tech. She brought up this idea of the internal healing IQ. And I got to reach out to her very recently and kind of get some clarity on that. And the concept is that we all sort of possess this intrinsic or inherent capacity to heal ourselves. However, we are sort of socialized to believe that we have to look outside in order to heal the inside, rather than looking inside to heal from the inside out. And her argument, uh, and this is particularly in regards to trauma, and her argument is that psychedelics, particularly, she uses um, MDMA and psilocybin. I think she does Ibogaine as well. All of these are just sort of different levels of either psychedelic or dissociative medications. Her theory and belief is that these medications sort of sidestep the ego, push it to the side, and allow you to start opening doors that trauma has historically closed. And you get to do it without judgment, without fear. And again, it's not a resolution. It's just, uh, you just get a snapshot, right? You get an idea of, oh shit, that's what's behind that door, right? And now I know what I need to work on. And then the real work actually begins. These are not medications you take every day. These are experiences that help you move into another state of awareness and then after that experience is over, dive in and really start to pick things apart. I think having this narrative around these medications is really important because again, we have, you're always gonna get, oh, this is just, you know, Suboxone for hippies, you know, or something like that. And it's not, it's not what, it's not MAT. It's something different. It's a different sort of treatment strategy. And 
I just want to really reiterate that because it's so new, but it's coming here. I guarantee you it will be here, and I guarantee you it will be misused, and I guarantee you the narrative around it and the purpose behind it will absolutely be, will be bastardized, just like it always is. It will become a commodity. So as clinicians, as people within the industry, really, 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 I want to just make sure that we get a clear understanding of what this actual movement is about and that we're educating people accordingly. So that's my soapbox. Uh, cool. All right. So also at that symposium, I had the pleasure of listening to, I don't know if you guys know, this is Dr. Uh, Daryl Shorter, Shorter. He is the uh, addictions uh, medical director at Menninger in Houston. An amazing man. Uh, he works primarily with the trans community in Houston, and um, his stories are harrowing. They, uh, he is a psychiatrist, and uh, you think, I mean, you think I have a bat in Colorado Springs, like this guy, he fights the real pill battles, like Texas is out of control. Um, you can actually, even having a fentanyl strip is considered paraphernalia, and you can be arrested for just having fentanyl strips even if you're a doctor. It's pretty wild. When you told me that, I was like, that can't be true, right? But no, it's considered paraphernalia. So it's a wide world out there, guys, and it's pretty, pretty ugly some places. So yeah. But what he did was introduce, his whole talk was on different models of treatment, right? So you have like the uh, biopsychosocial model, you have the um, disease model, moral model, all of that. Well, what he did was he introduced a sort of variation of the biopsychosocial model, the biopsychosocial spiritual model. I had never heard of this before. I don't have any of you guys ever. You have? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Totally new to me. Like, I was like, this guy is crazy. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Biopsychosocial. I'm like, at best, it's part of the social. But man, he made a really compelling argument that there is an aspect of spirituality that is vital to long-term sustainable recovery. So put a pin in that, we're gonna go back to it. But that was, again, just another seed that was planted in my brain that kind of had me start to think about, well, what is spirituality and treatment? Like, what does that even mean? What does that look like? And then, of course, there was this guy. So, yeah, yeah, there he is. So, uh, in February, TJ came out and, uh, word, 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 right here, yeah, uh, came out and did a two day seminar with all of the staff at Peaks, or at least all of those that could attend. And, of course, he is all about this sort of spiritual journey. Um, I don't know if you've ever talked to him for more than like five or six minutes, but you will get there. And one of his big tenets actually was this concept of people being whole and perfect. And that was, I don't know, man, like kind of like the word addiction. In my experience uh, with my own journey, so my own healing as um, growing up in a really conservative environment where, um, you know, coming out at age 17 was traumatic for so many reasons, primarily um, well, we'll get to that in a little bit, but uh, the idea of being broken was actually something that I really craved and I really embraced. It almost became an identity in and of itself. Um, it allowed me to accept the parts of myself that I didn't like, but it also, at the same time, didn't give me a whole lot of room to change them, you know? Acceptance is not change, I've learned as I've gotten older. It's kind of a pain in the ass, but, um, but it is the beginning of change. And so he, TJ plants this whole imperfect idea in my brain, and I'm like, all right, so within three weeks, I get these three big ideas. Internal healing IQ, plus the biopsychosocial spiritual, plus perfect wholeness, well, shit. It's <laughs> spirituality, yeah, there it is. So um, I was not thrilled that this was the conclusion, that this was, 
because I just, I, I don't know, I'm a cynic by nature, and that's where the picture came from. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I was like, this isn't real. Like, this, this is a bunch of garbage. Like, uh, there's so much, like, feeling hooey-gooey processy stuff out there that I just, again, I'm an operations guy. I just happen to have a degree in feelings. And, yeah. yeah uh, and so, but for me, it's, it's really hard to get over sort of those cerebral barriers that get put up. And a lot of those barriers, for me, come from religious trauma. So, what is religious trauma, you ask? Well, if you Google it, uh, the first thing that comes up is actually a definition from therapist.com. I was really surprised. It's pretty good. Uh, religious trauma occurs when a person's religious experience is stressful, degrading, dangerous, abusive, or damaging. Uh, traumatic religious experiences may harm or threaten to harm someone's physical, emotional, mental, sexual, or spiritual health and safety. Yes, I can attest to all of that. Yeah, all of it. Every last bit of it. Um, so again, coming out at age 17, high school in the Air Force Academy, amazingly conservative environment. Luckily, I had a, a pretty supportive family. Um, I kind of blew my dad's mind, but he's healed a uh, couple decades later. Um, but one of the, I think one of the hardest things that I experienced and probably the most psychologically violent thing I've ever experienced was actually having my faith taken from me. Yeah, when somebody takes God away from you and that's a core of your being, it's in your DNA and somebody says, nope, uh, man, that created a void inside of me um, that I did my very best to fill with drugs, with sex, with anybody who would pay attention to me, with anything that would make me feel connected. Uh, but that void is, I mean, if I'm perfectly honest, still there to a certain degree. It's better. It's less of a black hole than it used to be. But um, I, I think we don't talk about this a lot. Even though, as a, particularly within the queer community, <laughs> we have experienced it. Um, and because of the, the big T trauma that underlies this, we brush it off, we move on, we pretend like, oh, we actually don't even need that. Like, that type of stuff is for people who are narrow-minded or judgmental or just don't understand life the way we do. Yeah, I'm one of those people. So, so again, I have a lot of baggage. And <laughs> yeah, not my baggage, yeah, so, yeah. And uh, that was something that I wasn't really anticipating having to deal with. Uh, you know, we're talking like almost 30 years later. Like, uh, I didn't, I thought I was done with this. You know, I'd made my peace. You know, I moved back to Colorado Springs. I found my way. I created my world. I had my people. Uh, and I even felt like I had some level of spiritual connection. Um, but running into this wall and revisiting this trauma, I realized that I had a shit ton of work to do still, um, which is great as a therapist. Realize that? Yeah. Don't you love it? So if you guys have any referrals, that would be awesome. So, um, But I slowly but surely started to unpack my baggage and eventually was able to recognize that there is something about spirituality that was or is important to the healing process and recovery. Um, before I could figure out what that was, though, I needed to ask, well, what does spirituality and treatment look like right now? So this is going to get a little weird. But uh, all right, so mental health treatment. We have spirituality equals mindfulness. That's it, really. Like we don't, there, if you really deep, deep dive into mental health treatment, if you're a mental health clinician, this is about all you have when you're talking about spirituality. And if, again, we're all honest with each other, 
mindfulness has really just sort of been boiled down to the DBT and box breathing. So it's about calming your shit down when you get escalated and staying present in the moment. And that's great. That's wonderful, but it's not spiritual. That's just presence. That's just being able to calm your shit down. That's not the same as spiritual connection. So, um, so that was mental health treatment. I was pretty easy to get there. And honestly, I still feel like there was room to, to try to re-energize mindfulness, to try to, to bring back some sort of spiritual engagement within it. So I wasn't as complicated as when I went to substance use treatment, which got really weird. And uh, I, I wanted to be, please just let me like get through this next slide. It's not a lot of fun, but um, this is sort of what I ran into. Um, you know, for almost 100 years, the term higher power has just monopolized spirituality and substance use treatment, and that's not a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. However, especially for people who have religious trauma, I don't care how much you tell yourself, it can be anything I want, it can be anything I want, it can be anything I want. Higher power means God, and it means the Christian God. This is what, it, it's the, the sort of like dirty secret that we don't want to tell each other. It's the pink, it's the elephant in the room that people continue to deny. And again, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If that is your path, if that is your spiritual connection, if that is your higher power, go for it. However, it is exclusive in a lot of ways. Because of the baggage that we all carry, or at least those in the queer community who have really struggled with this, that the substance use treatment has been firmly grounded in religion, and it's a religion that has historically disenfranchised and the most vulnerable people, those that are also the most susceptible to substance use disorder. Uh, also, it perpetuates a narrative that these individuals cannot access or are not worthy of spiritual awakening. And it's that last part I think that's really important, that, uh, I don't know, like, my 12 step wasn't great. It was pretty, felt pretty forced to a certain degree. Um, it felt like something I had to have, not like something I deserved. So, again, personal experience. And nothing against, in fact, nothing against the 12 steps at all, nothing against the rooms, nothing against AA, NA, CA, whatever. Uh, it just, there, there is a, a, a part of that particular point of view that I just feel is inaccessible to a lot of us. So I wanted to figure out, one, again, going back to the question, why is spirituality and treatment important? And two, how can we make spirituality and treatment more accessible and inclusive? Seems fair, right? I got to, the, I got to this question, I was like, cool. I can breathe, like this is about, I can get past some of my skepticism, now we can just focus on acceptance and inclusion and all of those great words that we love to hear that make us feel good about ourselves because, you know, we're, we're doing something powerful and profound. Um, but the problem is, you know, big T trauma, it's really persistent. And I just, regressed a little bit. So this was my first step was to actually eliminate spirituality again. I just couldn't get over it. I had so much of my own shit going on. I, there was nothing I could do. Uh, and I, so I did what I always do, which is I just um, filled it with something that was very safe, very uh, cerebral, and very much uh, as far away from feelings as I could get. You know, thank God for the anxious, avoidant French, because I got, we have existentialism. So that felt really, really safe, right? Like, it's awesome. And, um, like, the protector part of me was super thrilled, and uh, I was able to sort of construct a model that was satisfyingly benign, which is this. Again, not great with titles, but here we go. 
uh, I tried to pick apart what are the pieces of existentialism that are really important and that these are the three that I came up with, identity, purpose, and meaning. The reason why they're important is because they all focus on intrinsic motivation, right? We've moved past extrinsic, we're going inside, and we give, we're redefining ourselves or we're getting to know who we are. We have purpose in our lives, and because we have those two things, we can create meaning that is sustainable. It's, I'm boring myself just talking about it, right? Like, it's not interesting, it's not profound, it's really anticlimactic, but of course at the time I thought, oh geez, this is genius, this is good shit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a book, it's gonna be awesome, and I'm gonna go up, go to LA, give a talk, people are gonna be super thrilled about it. Yeah, that didn't actually happen, uh, but I really wanted to stop there. Um, from just a personal, perspective, I didn't want to go any deeper. I just didn't want to do it. Um, but again, that's not me. But uh, I kept hitting this like wall. Oh my god, it's so, it was pissing me off. Um, like, why can't I get past this idea that I forgot something? Like, like I, I've eliminated spirituality from treatment completely. We've got existentialism instead. We actually integrated that into our programming at Peaks because I was so gung-ho about it. And uh, my chief clinical officer, who's sitting over there on his phone, it's all right, he's working, yeah. <laughs> uh, was, had my back and everybody got super excited and uh, we were able to do some really meaningful stuff. Um, but it just didn't do it for the clients. Like it made us feel good, but the clients were like, what the what in the hell are you guys talking about? You know, how am I going to get identity, purpose, and meaning out of a 30-day program? Like, what? You know, uh, something was still missing, and I, it came to me. I forgot connection. I forgot that peace that is the opposite of suffering. I forgot that uh, we can't just be in our head. That we do have to be in our hearts. That we actually have to find. Uh, meaning beyond ourselves. Um, and maybe we had to figure out there's a, or find that there's a version of ourselves that we just haven't connected to or that we need to reconnect with. So, so I asked myself, who can I turn to for more guidance and answers? And there he is, guys. So, yeah. <laughs> I have his permission. I asked, can I use your image in my speech? Yeah, and, uh, it's great. Yeah, I mean, that's my higher power right there. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually my Christmas card right there. So yeah, but so I, I did. I went back, I went to con back to conscious recovery and um, you know, it's something that we started to integrate into our program at Beaks after uh, TJ came. And I um, particularly focused on the idea of authentic wholeness, wholeness. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, really interesting concept. And I decided to pull apart what I thought would fit into the existentialism model that I created. Uh, so you'll see we still have identity, we have purpose, we have meaning, but then we also have forgiveness. So I forgot to address shame. So there's the shame piece. Uh, connection, because again, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a community. Uh, we need a tribe to a certain degree. And then grace and humility. Uh, and that is actually not just for yourself, but for other people. Um, recovery is a selfish process, right? Does it, should it be always? You know, at some point, we have some amends to make. And uh, at some point, we have to remember that if we are whole, then so is everybody else, even if we don't like them. So, uh, and that's for another slideshow altogether. But um, essentially, I came to this idea of intrinsic integration, that the process of integrating all of these pieces, that is actually treatment. Um, that maybe this 
is what we are supposed to do. These are the things that we're supposed to focus on. It's not about psychoeducation. Um, it's not about CBT. It's not about DBT. It's about finding yourself, right? And that is a spiritual process. Uh, yeah, still I was really frustrated that I could not get past spirituality. And so I even went back a little further and I asked myself, what would Bill W. do? Um, and God, you want to know what he did? Uh, he did psychedelics. Yeah, it's crazy, right? We don't talk about that a whole lot, but he, this was part of his journey. Like he actually utilized psychedelics as a tool to have his own spiritual awakening. It's why we have the 12th step. And then things started to come full circle. I was like, all right, here we go. This, this is the tool that we can use to help people have that spiritual awakening. But we have to have these other pieces in place. And if you look at it, it's not a one for one, but a lot of these principles are pretty consistent with the 12 steps, right? There are a lot of them there. However, this takes a step back, provides us more space, and allows us to be more inclusive. Also, for those of us who have struggled with religious trauma, it gives us some hope that we can actually reconnect to something spiritual and not have to um, sort of pretend like we are accepting something that we don't. So, cool. So psychedelic and botanical medications offer an expansion to the spiritual scaffolding of traditional treatment, promising a more empowered spiritual journey grounded in ritual and self-healing. So again, what does that mean for us as clinicians? Well, it brings us back to the internal healing IQ, and that's where I am right now. I don't really know what the next step is. But I do want to ask, what if our role as therapists shifted to helping individuals develop their internal healing IQ and reconnect to their whole and perfect selves? What if that was our job? What if we've been doing this wrong? Not wrong, but just not all the way. Um, and so that's the question that I'm going to present to you guys. It's the question that I'm going to leave you with. The rest of these are just notes. And yeah, I mean, I found a really cool picture <laughs> yeah. that I couldn't use. Um, but yeah, as the old pillars of our industry, whether away to relics, we must decide as a collective on which foundations to build our faith. I did quote myself there. That's really awful. But yeah. So that's it. This is the part. I'm going to go around. Please raise your hand because I know there's some interest in uh, questions and stuff like that. Please raise your hand. I'll come over to you with a mic. Any hands raised? Anybody want to ask any questions? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that. I really enjoyed it. So sure. my question is because uh, you mentioned your own struggle with uh, spirituality, have you yourself uh, uh, tried this to discover your own uh, spirituality? Um, I mean, I've dabbled, not going to lie. I think uh, I did, uh, I went through this like big Buddhist phase when I was in my early, late teens, early 20s. I lived in Boulder and um, I found a lot of solace there actually and, and I think it brought um, the sort of spiritual aspects to mindfulness. But then, you know, there's this concept of spiritual materialism that is actually a concept by Chungun Trungpa Rinpoche, and he started the Naropa College or Naropa University in Boulder. And, you know, it's the sort of, we westernize things, right? Um, and I, we, I really struggled with getting past that. I think um, it became more about something that I was doing rather than something I was being. And, uh, I uh, like a lot of people, I think, that dabble in different types of faiths and kind of, um, you know, just like faith shopping, basically. It's like shoes, right? You try them on, they don't fit. Uh, that, was, that was sort of that early part of the journey for me. 
And then I really went in my head, honestly. Like, I'm a thinker. Um, I went into books. I went into story. I went into... Uh, I looked everywhere, but I never really looked inside. And I don't know that I ever... I think that that's actually, like, a next phase of my own journey. You know, I'm, I'm 44, but, man, I'm an infant when it comes to this. Which, again, I think is why I... Like, the struggle was very real. Like, this process of trying to even get this out was very hard. Um, I don't, I didn't want to face this. And again, I think part of it is just, it's the trauma I experienced when I was young, but also I think the fact that I still live in that environment. Um, I don't have a lot of breathing room when it comes to that. So to challenge that is to have to face it immediately and without, uh, without really any protection. So, uh, long answer, no, I haven't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> At least not, I haven't done it well. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody else? Coming. Nobody. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll call. Oh, hold on. Do I hold no. it or no? no. Do you hold it? <laughs> uh, I just have a comment. I appreciate uh First, you did a great job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your perspective. I believe that that's kind of where, I mean, just like AA and everything has evolved, I believe that it's a collective. Sure. Uh, pers uh, you know, expressing your, uh, your perspective, because that gives the clinicians and, and therapists, you know, that's how we evolve into this. Because, Absolutely. You know, and that's how we become a part of. So I appreciate you coming out and sharing your perspective. Um, I need to hear that, you know, different in order for yeah. me to grow with my clients or my, you know, the people that I work with. Um, so I, I just, you know, I wanted to just well, say that. You did a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. So. Prince in back. Of course, I'm sitting farthest away. <laughs> so I totally appreciated everything you said, and I loved your diagram of authentic wholeness. Um, my question is, how is how what is the practical application of that? Because as somebody who has been sober since the Queen was in office, um, <laughs> you know, and using the twelve steps, which I completely agree with your religious. You know, I understand the religious trauma part. Sure. I didn't come from a religious home, so for me. It was the opposite. Like it was so much. My religious trauma was anybody who believes in God's an idiot. So, which is a form of trauma as well, right? Sure, absolutely. So it took me years to get through the steps and looking at them in a different way without all of a sudden creating that stigma for myself, right? right. Oh, now you're now you believe in God. Okay, you're an idiot too, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so what is the practical application of how do you step somebody through that authentic wholeness process, which is, I mean, really what the steps are, right? right? Minus the God part, but it's, it's that process of identifying who I am, figuring out what my purpose is, all of that stuff that you're talking about. You know, is is it a series of steps? Is it a series of questions? Is it a you know what I mean? So right. what is what's the practical application of it? Because that becomes, I think, the hardest part in any of this is right. how do we transmit the amazing ideas that are given to us? Because I can have a conversation with you all day long, right? But right. That doesn't mean that the practical application is accessible. Right. So. So I think, I, I think it's a great question. <laughs> and as an operations person, I love it. You're great. I want to talk to you. So, yeah. uh, but I, I think that that's, um, it's actually pretty hard. I'm going to skirt it a little bit. It's pretty hard to answer because I, we're so new, particularly in the psychedelic aspect of this. I do think that there is an important piece that that plays. I think that we are, um, you know, talk therapy is limited. It just is. Because in the end, a lot of what heals people, I mean, even, you know, as clinicians, we know that it, the, the rapport and the actual relationship that we have with our client is the healing agent, right? It's not like what technique you're using. It's not, oh, I'm a master of motivational interviewing. You know, like that's not it. It's, it's the connection. It's the experience. It's that openness. It's that safety that we create, right? So how do we replicate safety you know and then within once we have a safe environment how do we help people again to bypass all of those barriers that you have in front of you and i think that that's when we get 
uh, that's when we can start to, to kind of access psychedelic medication, dissociative medication. I mean, right now, ketamine therapy is really popular, at least in Colorado. I don't know. Do you guys have it a lot out here? Is that it? Yeah. So, and it, it's, I mean, I think it's okay. Uh, it's a dissociative state, again, so you get to kind of sidestep the ego, but you're also pretty out of it, you know. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard, like, a ketamine scream, like somebody who's in, like, thinks they're dying while they're on ketamine. That's an amazing experience. Hard to process, though, while they're in it. Um, but somebody, um, again, I think that there are, uh, it, it, but it's a tool, right? It's a path. It's an option. Um, the rest of it, the app, as far as the step-by-step, -step, this is how I'm going to get you to find your identity. This is how I'm going to get you to find meaning. This is how I'm going to get you to find purpose. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think that there is a portion of that. I, I don't think that that's a thing. I, I, even within the steps, again, it's, I mean, how much of the 12 steps efficacy is about community, right? Yeah. 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 Is it really about the steps? It's about fellowship. Yeah. So how do you replicate fellowship? I mean, it, the 90 and 90, I mean, I did it, and it saved my life, for sure, because I had people. I had a place to go. I had something to connect to. I had a world, and I mean, I was living at the time in a town of 2,000 people, and it was not L.A. I mean, let's just put it that way. Like, it, it was, uh, uh, they, they weren't, even though I wouldn't have said that they are part of my tribe, they were, they were family in that moment, right? So um, I actually wonder if, because we're always looking for a step-by-step, -step, because we're always looking for a practical application, and like I want, as long as we check the box and we go through, first you're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, are, are, is that actually prohibiting us from fully engaging with the client? Because we're focusing on a process and not on a person. Um, So, and if we really, if we ask, if we really ask that question, it's different for everybody, right? Like, there is no one answer. Like, it depends on the client, you know? Like, somebody who takes ayahuasca, if I took ayahuasca and you took ayahuasca, I guarantee you we're having two different experiences. Like, we are going to uncover different things. We are going to come to different places. We are going to have different insights. We are going to have a real person, like, a true individualized experience. And we talk about that all the time, right? Individualized care. You know, oh yeah, we do individualized care. It's different for everybody. No, it's not. Like, it's, it's not. I mean, if you have a curriculum in your program, we do, you know? We can individualize it-ish. But what if we're actually, what if we fully strip things down and just allow the experience to guide us? Yeah. Like, the skill comes with the connection. Because really, at that point, to be a great therapist is to be a therapist that can get out of your own way. Right? It's somebody who can fully meet and be present with another person, regardless of who they are and what they're experiencing. And that is not easy to do. If we're really honest again with ourselves, like, that is really freaking hard to do. You know? And again, I live in a very, the world in which I live, the majority of the people that I run into, uh, if they knew who I was as a person, they would, not, they would not love me. They would not accept me. But I have to love and accept them. And it has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. Yeah. So maybe the step-by-step -step process is more about how do I tear down my own walls so that I can be more fully present with that client in that moment. So that's the best I can give you, sorry. So I'm a California therapist, and I don't live in a like conservative environment. And I, as a private practice therapist, I choose that because I'm allowed to account spirituality into my work. Conscious recovery is one model that I would highly recommend to people. I do also think Gabor Mate is someone mm -hmm. you want to follow, um, Janina Fisher. So for the folks who aren't clinically inclined, become clinically inclined, because there are a lot of people who are now thinking outside of the box 
thank you for sharing this. This is everything that I, ever since I've worked with TJ, that is all my work. It's about building relationships with my clients. You create safety by being in a relationship with your client in the sense that when you're a therapist, they tell you don't build a relationship yep. with your client. So to be honest, in order to incorporate that, I take a risk clinically to say I'm not going to do exactly what the the BBS and the board wants me to do, but I tell my clients that ahead of time. So they know what to expect from me. And immediately when I have a consultation, you're a whole and perfect, that's not my work. My work is to help you believe you're whole and perfect. So it does, you have to sort of, as a clinician, because I've gone through the same process as you, I've had religious trauma, mm -hmm. I've had to, was I gonna come out queer? Like, I think it's just as much of a personal experience as it is for you to decide who are the leaders you want to follow and incorporate in your work? There are a lot of leaders right now doing it, huh. including conscious recovery. <laughs> so, yeah. If you're looking for something very spiritual, but you can also look into um, process-based therapy. That's another therapy that will incorporate these different categories into your work. In, in other words, it, the idea is there is no one size fits all. There are these internal processes in which you address. And from a process-based model, it's usually values, Mm -hmm. interpersonal effectiveness, um, cognitive processing, like it's a slew of those. So there are models. It's not the motivational interviewing model that you learn in substance abuse. It's not 12 step, because 12 step again is limiting, I think. You know, I, I'm, I worked in recovery. I kind of had my own recovery journal, journey, so I speak from that. But I think depending on what areas you're in and your comfortability, like I do that because in LA, I think there's room for it also, so. But thank you for no. sharing your personal experience. And I thank think you. you're right where you need, in my perspective, clinically, and what I see for the community as a whole, like yeah. that's what it is. And I think it's an option to explore things outside of the medical model because the medical model creates you as an issue. Absolutely. This is what it is. Oh, that was beautifully said. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was great. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that. So, so thank you. Can you touch on the, uh, I guess, you know, psychedelics are, touchy, are still a touchy conversation. Right? For sure. In California, yeah. and I, I'm assuming Colorado Academy is legal, but what about the legalities of other psychedelics? So, um, the, so if, we're, if we're talking strictly about legality, uh, Colorado um, legalized or decriminalized. 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 Yeah, yeah, legal, for right? sure. Yeah. Five different psychedelics. That's it. And only psilocybin will be accessible for clinical use starting in 2025. So it's like a, they're kind of um, uh, titrating almost, you know, like they're, they're bringing one on and then another and then another, but they, psilocybin tends to be the one that is the most researched already. Um, and it has, I mean, if we're honest, like it has the most social acceptance because it's been utilized so much with the vet, veteran population. So it kind of crosses political lines a little bit there and uh, gives a little bit more wiggle room and freedom to explore. Um, the, the other legal components as far as like, I'm a licensed clinician, right? Uh, you run into issues with things like liability insurance. Like that's gonna be a conversation that's gonna have to be had. Um, and this is what happens when things are state specific. Um, you, you run into federal law all the time. So I think at least in Colorado, what they're trying to not do <laughs> is go down the same path as the f uh, legalization of <laughs> recreational marijuana, which was a total shit show. Like it really was. Like there was just no, uh, bless you, like there was just like no real clear direction. And so um, what they're doing right now in Colorado is they are creating community panels. Um, and these panels include not only medical professionals, clinical professionals, but also um, people of um, indigenous tribes, people of, um, who, who utilize these things currently from a very much a spiritual perspective and a cultural perspective. So they're trying to, to encapsulate the community component in order to help shape the law. But again, that law is only gonna exist in Colorado. Uh, Oregon has also decriminalized um, psilocybin, but they, as far as my understanding, you're actually, as a, you can't use it as a clinician, you have to be a doctor. So they've already kind of, you know, cut their tail off and, and uh, really limit the, limited the capacity uh, for people who need or would benefit from 
these medications. So. So I get, yeah, because, I mean, we talked about, like, the, the steps, and, and I get it, you know, when we feel like if I'm going from one to two, but the client's on four, like, yeah. what am I doing here and all the steps, yeah. right? Prepping somebody to have a psychedelic induced spiritual experience because yeah. that's that's how we get from a to b is you got to have the psychedelic experience yeah. to get the spiritual experience is there prep work involved with that absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely um so um dr dana as i call her she is actually an md and um currently has a practice where she works um and does uh psychedelic journeys with her patients um now her process is one the initial screening is everything. Can are you even a good fit for this type of process? If you're in active psychosis, no, like you can't do it. Like it's not good. You know, if you have, uh, and there are certain other mental health diagnoses. Like if you're uh, in a manic episode and you have bipolar, uh, if you there are there are other um, sort of presenting symptoms that would eliminate you from the from being ready for that experience. So that's just the first step. Like, can you even benefit from this medication, or is it going to exacerbate symptoms that are already presenting that are acute and damaging? So then you have to sit and start to build a relationship, right? And so that can be a bunch, that can be one session, that can be two sessions, uh, it can be 10 sessions. It's about building that relationship, and more than anything, to her earlier point, it's about building safety. It's until that relationship is safe, the, the efficacy of that ec psychedelic experience will not be as um, powerful as it could be. It's kind of like the reward at the end of the... Because I know, like, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it sidesteps the ego. It allows you to begin to build safety. It allows yeah. you to be... It's like you do it towards the beginning of your process of healing. Yeah. So that you can kind of start tearing down your walls. And Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> end, right? like yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not a starting off point. Right. Yeah. No, it's, um, I mean, maybe towards like the middle end, you know, like, but there is a process to get there. And uh, it's almost like EMDR, right? Like you have to create those safe places. You have to, you have to set up containers. You have to do all of those. There's a whole process beforehand uh, before you do the deep dive into the trauma. So I would, I would kind of draw a parallel to that. Does that make sense? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a lot of questions. Um, and, <laughs> um, I Perfect. just want to start by saying um, one of the things that I am 100% in favor of is anything involving TJ. Um, TJ is fantastic. Conscious sure. recovery is something that um, the moment I ever, I first ever heard him open his mouth, I was like, I do this every day. This is how we function at my facility in regards to um, uh, obtaining and maintaining uh, relationships with our clients. Uh, what inadvertently, like that's just something I've, we have are on the same wavelength as far as like, sure. you know, giving them attention in a way that other people won't, um, viewing them as a spiritual being, having a human experience, all these things, other things I personally believe in. So I, I, I commend you for working with TJ. The questions I have are, 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 are mainly surrounding harm. Okay. Harm caused in regards to um, administering ketamine to a, a client with addiction and and. I, I, I appreciate the fact that you said that these are your opinions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, but is there, um, do you not see a, a danger in, in uh, applying your opinions um, in, a, in a way to help people who, say I'm a client who's got like you know, using fentanyl and I'm on the internet and I'm looking for a place to go and I, and I don't know anything about anything. Sure. And I end up at your facility instead of someone else's facility. Yeah. And um, you know, I have, a, a, I mean, you don't believe that SUD is real and you don't believe addiction is real. So, I believe SUD is real. I don't, addiction is the construct. SUD is in the DSM. It's the actual medical term. Addiction is the sort of like social way that we talk about substance use disorder, but it has all of this sort of shame and stigma attached to it. So rather than using that kind of, using that particular language, using the substance use disorder language is really what it's about. And it is, it's a, it's a diagnosable medical condition, but it is a mental health disorder. It is in, in the DSM-5 as such. It's not separate then. It doesn't have its own book, doesn't have its own thing. Um, we just treat it like it's different. Well, there's a, it is sense. different because there's a, there's a chemical 
there, sure. there's a damage to the prefrontal cortex that is proven by the National Institution of Health and the National right. Institution of Drug Abuse by uh, Miss Nora Volkow, who's the person who discovered that addiction wasn't actually a disease of the brain. Sure. Um, so yeah. she's the person that pioneered our industry, all of us. And in regards to that being said, um, because there is damage to that portion of the brain, ketamine is an addictive substance as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, psilocybin, I, that's something that I, I feel it has a lot more room for, for yeah. applica application in, in our yeah. field. So here's my question. In yeah. real time, I'm a client. I come to you. I'm, I'm smoking fentanyl. I'm yeah. doing meth. I'm slamming. All these things. When, how, what does my treatment look like in real time? So ketamine is at least... Where we work, or where I work, uh, we don't use ketamine for substance use disorder. We okay. use ketamine for one thing, active suicidal ideation. Okay. That's it. So uh, the dissociative experience is specific to the client and to their symptoms, right? And to their diagnosis. Again, there is no panacea. There is no one thing works for everybody. This is the, it's, that's the problem, right? The reality is everybody's treatment's gonna be different. Like it absolutely has to be specific. And if you have substance use disorder, I'm not gonna pump you full of ketamine. However, if you do are addicted to fentanyl, highly recommend you go on Suboxone because we don't have an opioid crisis, we have an overdose crisis right now. We're in an overdose epidemic and Suboxone is protective in that factor, right? So. Um, but again, that's even controversial, right? Even medication-assisted treatment is controversial, and it doesn't work for everybody, you know? Because again, we'll see people that come in for, with Suboxone addiction. Yeah, right. but it doesn't mean that we're not gonna give Suboxone to people that need it. So you also do medically-assisted treatments as well? We do, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and so that being said, it would, if you have these clients that are only mental health uh -huh. with suicidal yep. ideations, um, and then you have clients that are completely SUD, Yep. Um, are they tra are they on separate tracks? Or are they not? Are they all together? Because all together. It's, it's mental health. Absolutely. Okay. So. So um, that's that's the that and so that's the little nuance there, right? Yeah, because we the the treatment is pretty similar. You know. It's, so what about the substance use? Because when you're a, you know addiction is described as or as a a a, a, um, a disease of the brain, addiction of the body. Yeah, but but you're you're seeking. You're sure. seeking that you're you're drug seeking, right? right? So you're med seeking, you're drug seeking. That's part of what addiction is, as compo as compared to in comparison to chemical dependency, right? You become chemically dependent because sure. you're prescribed something and then you try to stop and you're dependent. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. SUD is I'm seeking out a, a, a drug. That's the difference. You seek it out after you've been prescribed, or whatever it might be. Right. So, what does that look like in real time when you have the SUD client who's like, I want some ketamine. Say how no. Do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, you just say no. Yeah, we don't. Use, that's not what it's utilized for. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to, as a as a facility, you have to have clear narratives and really clear, uh, and a clear um, understanding and intention behind the things why you do things the way you do. Uh, of course, people drug seek. It's addiction, in that yes. sense, right? It's substance use. Like you're. Um, what you see though is most people are looking for release. The same reason that people are seeking substances are, is the reason why they cut, right? They're looking for release. They're looking for relief in that sense. So in that way, the two come together pretty clearly. Um, as far as like these other strategies, particularly uh, things like ketamine, and again, like we're not even in the psilocybin world yet. Like we're not, it's coming. So you're not prescribing psilocybin at this point? No, it's not legal yet. Okay. for us to do that clinically. Mm -hmm. It's decriminalized in the state, um, but as far as the clinical application of it, it's still very much new, which is okay. why there's not a whole lot of complete answers yet. Like who's the perfect client for this? I mean, really at this point, I can just eliminate the ones that are blaringly, obviously not appropriate for it, right? Right. That's, that's about as far as you can get right now. Um, now let's say you have somebody who has active suicidal ideation, and they have an, and they're in treatment for um, uh, benzo use, like benzodiazepine use. Mm -hmm. Again, ketamine is not going to be the right answer. You know, you're going to have to find a different strategy. They're already into a dissociative medication. Like you can't use that in that so you're moment. Not, you're not, you're not uh, suggesting ketamine use for anyone with SUD. Uh, no. Okay, that's no. good. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, one, one more thing. So if I'm a client and I come in 
and I'm um, actively participating in my spiritual 12-step program because yeah. for me uh, and for a lot of people that I know, the 12 steps are about a spiritual experience and that's Absolutely. what's encouraged in order to achieve what we achieve in freedom from from obsession and all the other things. Absolutely. Um, so uh, maybe that wasn't your experience. Also, you said those were your you know opinions, and yeah, I appreciate absolutely. that you yeah. used the word opinion. So if I come to your facility, I'm like, I have a sponsor. I participate in meetings. Yeah. Um, is that how is that embraced? And if if that's not your school, absolutely. Thought? Yeah, it's part of it. Yeah, it's inclusive. I think that's the thing. It's just it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be all of it. Mm -hmm. Like it's there's there's just. It's not about eliminating space, it's about creating more space. That's why the title is a new book for the Old Testament of treatment, not a new testament. You know, it's just another addition to the story. Like that there is another option, there are other ways to look at this that allow for people who do have negative experiences or suffer from something like religious trauma, it gives them a door and a pathway to spirituality that has otherwise been sort of closed off to them. Not necessarily, not intentionally. And it's not that the, the 12 steps or the rooms or that AA are, the, are forbidding it. It's just that that's how it's been adopted, right? That's how it's sort of been, it, it just transforms that way, particularly in communities like the ones that I live yeah. in, right? So again, not everywhere is LA as another that's part of the story. Fact. <laughs> you know, so we have to we have to have an uh, a, an awareness of that. I think we live in our bubbles, right? Like I lived in New York City for a long time. Like it was great. Also, I don't live in New York City anymore. You know, like it just it, it's, it's, you guys saw where I live. So, um, but so it's not about one or the other. That this is right and that's wrong. It's that everybody's journey is going to look different, and as many paths as we can offer them the better opportunity and chance we have at actually giving them the help that they need. So, so we do 12-step meetings, we do Dharma meetings, we do NAMI meetings. I don't know if you guys are familiar with NAMI. It's, uh, we, do, uh, you, we do church service if you want to go to church on Sunday. And the church service is run by somebody who is in, it's a 12-step based program, you know? So I feel I, it's, like incorporating that knowledge into what you're sharing about the peaks is important. Right. Because it yeah. felt very um, anti oh, yeah. anything else other than what you were presenting. So my perception of this presentation was that you were anti twelve steps. And all oh no, not at all. And that's yeah. what that, yeah. that was your so that's why I wanted to ask those questions because I was a little confused because it didn't seem inclusive. Right. Well I appreciate, I appreciate the appreciate I yeah, I, and I appreciate you asking the question. You know, it's a, uh, I mean obviously there's um I, I think depending on where, it, it, this is I think what my criticism of is kind of the substance use treatment field, that it hasn't been inclusive, that we've been so AA 12 step focused that this is the truth in the path, right? And that there has, to, at some point, you know, that's a hundred years ago almost. Like that book was written in the 30s. And like, it's worked for 82 years. Yeah, it has, but not for everybody. It's worked for some people for the last 82 years. So keep it. But you said keep it worked it. for you as well, though. So keep it. Yeah, learning. some parts of it did. Mm -hmm. So keep it. Mm -hmm. But also recognize there are other options. Right. Like there are other journeys. There are other paths. There are other ways to do this that are just as valid, that are just as powerful, that will work for the next 82 years for some individuals. It's a matter of, again, like I think it's really ironic that the treatment industry can be so narrow sometimes. Like, it's, it's very... Um, it's not culturally sensitive to other people. Yeah. Like, that's the other yeah. thing to do. Like, if you're looking at the history, it's not culturally, it doesn't take in, like, other cultural approaches, like, especially yeah. indigenous approaches. Like, this is, these are things we've used, and they weren't stigmatized. They were used ceremonially and appropriately, but... Yeah. People in America abuse them, not the people right. in which they came from and the practices. Like, same way people abuse alcohol and it's legalized right. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, ayahuasca has been effective for thousands of years. I agree with that. Yeah. So it's, I think it's just a matter of like, okay, let's, let's start that conversation and realize, man, we built on something that was really strong and really powerful and works. Also, we recognize that it has limitations. Just everything has limitations. There is no one thing that is going to work for everybody. There is not a silver bullet. There is not a panacea. It does not exist. Like, we have to be open and we have to 
look at different ways in which we can engage people in their treatment. And it's not about exclusion at all. It's about actually opening the doors, but then also having tough conversations around why doesn't this work for people? You know, like I, everything about the 12 steps worked until I got to the 12th step. And then you feel pretty lost. It's like, wait, what did I just do? Like, where am I, what am I actually happening right now? And then having that moment of where you look inside and you're like, it's really, I just needed friends, you know? I needed a place to go on Friday nights. You know, I needed, I needed shitty coffee and disgusting yeah. cookies, you know? Like, but, but that was real. Like, that was healing for I mean, me. It wasn't, uh, I mean, like, for me personally, you know, <laughs> that, that whole, you know, experience of writing all these things down that happened to me and sharing those with somebody, that was very powerful beyond a cup of coffee and a shitty sure. meeting. Right. You know? So, yeah. I mean, that Well, the meetings so, weren't shitty, this, just the cookies. Sometimes yeah. meetings were shitty. <laughs> yeah, you know? they can be, yeah, and for sure. people, that's why principles for personalities type thing. But, yeah. but um, I, I also feel that, like, I used a lot of hallucinogens in my life, a, mm -hmm. a whole bunch for yeah. many years. So I, I see value in that. Um, I, I see value in that in a therapeutic way. I do see value yeah. in that. And that's why I, had, I just was like warning more about the ketamine situation. Because oh yeah, ketamine no. itself is is like I, that's the only cells, that's the only hallucinogen that I really have concern with. Yeah, it's actually out of all of the dissociative medications, it's my I think least it's favorite. The only it's was, like, actually it's the only one that you can <laughs> use. Yeah, it's my least favorite. Yeah, by okay, far. Me too. Yeah, so and that's again, that's mm -hmm. that is opinion as well. Right. That's why we're really limited in in why at least it if for it peaks and, and this just happens to align with my personal belief system. We're just really limited as far as who we give access to and the actual symptoms that are presenting um, when we recommend it. It's very rare. Thank very, you so very, much very for rare. Time yeah. My oh yeah. Thanks for asking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rory. Um, it's oh, wow. more just a, a share. Sure. Um, thank you, Clinton, yeah, absolutely. for presenting. And I, I just feel like, there, like there's like an arc throughout this whole ex uh, conversation that I really appreciate about, and it kind of reminded me of, uh, like I'm going to paraphrase a quote from Khalil Gibran, where like we have different branches that reach up to the same sun, and we mm -hmm. may like have different experiences of what it's going to look like, or how we make meaning of things, or how we relate. The concepts of spirituality, um, but it's going towards the same space. So Absolutely. we're like, you know, so it may look so different. And so when I was thinking about the therapeutic piece um, of like being a therapist, working with a client, and um, and I really appreciated your part about like having just being a human being with them, yeah. but also having that curiosity because they're going to create their own meaning. Like we're Absolutely. not we're not there to tell them what they believe or what works for them. They're going to discover themselves when they're in a safe environment where they um, are able to do that inner work. And, 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 and having a safe environment that has connection, because yeah. that human connection is healing, creates the foundation for them to do their own internal healing. And, um, and that's going to look different for every single person. <laughs> so it's not, it's not a one yeah, size all. Um, so I just really, I really appreciate this talk because you're bringing in um, like, medical conversations in that way and like you know different concepts and I think that's really beautiful and I think that's a really good direction for treatment in general. Oh, so I appreciate you. that. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.